Namaskar. One of the shining stars of the Indian investing community is gone. I'm talking about Rakesh Junjunwala. Somebody who set the agenda, somebody who was compared to Warren Buffett, uh, he earned the moniker Warren Buffett of India. And you could see him in CNBC setting the day in progress, talking about various stocks almost five days a week. And recently he had launched this project called Akasa Air. Uh, let's listen to the experience of his good friend, Suhail Said, as to what kind of a person Rahil uh, Rakesh Junjunwala was and how he would like to be remembered. Suhail, Namaskar, and thank you for taking Namaskar, time out please. to join with us. Uh, you, you take it away, Suhail, your memories of your dear friend Rakesh Junjunwala. So I've known Rakesh now for what, almost 20, 25 years. And uh, obviously we used to meet socially. I have nothing to do with the markets. I don't even invest in the markets. But I always found in him, uh, Sri, a rare, rare optimist. He never had a bad thing to say about country, about people. He was, he was very straightforward in his approach. He genuinely believed that India's potential remained untapped. He was very direct. He wouldn't hold back. I mean, I remember many interviews of his to media channels where he would question uh, the probity, the transparency and the impartiality of the media itself. And he would say things that he generally believed in without care. Over the years, a lot of people would ask me, you know, we want to meet Rakesh. You know? I said, see, he's not the kind who opens out easily. While he may at a party be gregarious and be friendly, but there's a very, very private side to him, as it is to most people who ostensibly are gregarious. But that private side was because, Sri, he was a great believer in understanding and looking at value investing. You know, he would hate being called a stockbroker, and I would purposely call him a stockbroker just to irritate him. Because he would then turn around and say, Tum sala advertising ka admi, not marketing, advertising. Salesman hai tum. So we should have this constant banter. But I always thought of him as never the big picture man. He was always the small picture man. Because when he looked at companies, when he looked at uh, uh, investing in companies, he looked at not the inherent present value at the time that he was investing in. He looked at the inherent value that would appreciate and appropriate over the years of that company. And one example is when he invested in, uh, in Titan, his value of investment was about 900 crores. Today, that amount is 11,000 crores. And he believed in people. He believed in those companies. He stood and stayed the course. In fact, many people would say that, oh, you know, is he the Warren Buffett of India? I would say no. Warren Buffett is the Rakesh Junirwala of America. Why do we have to appropriate some American icon as our own when we have such a fabulous icon amidst us? A, B, Rakesh was also a person with deep interests in everything Indian. You know, he was not jingoistic, but he was a deep patriot. He was a nationalist. His belief was that India can do a lot more and that India will continue to do a lot more. Or Joby blockages here, Joby obstacles here. These are obstacles that we need to overcome. You know, he would criticize the system when it when it needed to be criticized. But he was not the kind of person, Sri, who had a problem for every solution. He had a solution for every problem. And when you're, you know, advising people, when you're an investor, when you're uh, being in the market, the stress of the market is so much that it sometimes prevents objectivity from creeping in into your you know, mind, into your soul. But he never allowed that. You know, when he would meet people, when he would talk to people about the India story, it was almost as if he was running India, as if he owned India. So the belief also then, then transcended just his operations in the markets. It actually went into the companies he was incubating, into the companies he was supporting, into people that he was helping. You know, whether it was giving a student 3,000 rupees because that is what he wanted for a particular educational course, he would do that. Because he generally believed 
that India will only be as strong if the weakest link is strengthened, not if only the strongest link is continuously embellished and re-strengthened. His belief tree was that India's potential lies in everyone. He wasn't someone who would castigate the rich and, you know, say, oh, I'm for, I'm for the poor. No, he was for every Indian because he was for India. You know, I've always said about him and I was introducing him to someone about three, four months ago. And I said, he embodies Bharatiyata. He embodies what is Indian and what Indianness is. You know, if you go back to our Shastra Sri and you're an expert on that, and if you go back into our literature, we were taught that ethics and empathy are intertwined. That ethics can't be without empathy. Empathy can't be ethicless. He was also a great believer that if I have to move forward, I can't move forward alone. I have to carry people with me. And you can only carry people in two ways. One is when you excite them inspirationally or when you scare them through fear. He always chose the former. He believed that his role was to involve, invigorate, and inspire people. And when you look at those three eyes, they merge beautifully into the biggest eye for us all, which is India. So when you involve, invigorate, and inspire, then that is what is essentially Indian. And that is the Indianness that he was proud about and that he was willing to put his neck out for, willing to dissipate that Indianness and share that Indianness with whoever came in his way. Thank you, Suhail, for that wonderful phrase there, three eyes. And with your permission, I just want to play for our viewers a different side of Rakesh yeah. that he shared and that you shared with me. We're just going to show this very short video and then your comments on how this thing came about. Let's play the video, please. Lakshmi, just like he wrote things for Rekha, I'm also going to write a poem for you. And uh, then we'll talk, but it'll be a beautiful poem and be written in English, not in Hindi. Bye. <laughs> How did so, that come about? I'll tell you. Of all the qualities Rakesh Junavala has, one which is very uh, uh, less known or little known is his deep romantic side and his uh, adorable love for his wife, Rekha. One day, this is actually in his office. One day, we were just yakking. And as I told you, I have nothing to do with the markets. I don't understand stock market, nothing. So we were sitting and talking. And yeah, and at that time, I was telling him about how he should support Prithvi Theatre. And I even got him to speak to Kunal Kapoor. As we were talking, he's saying, I am very romantic. 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 I so I said, okay, I'll pledge on video. So I FaceTimed Lakshmi, my wife, while he's sitting with me. And I said, Lakshmi, you know, I'm going to pen a poem for you, just like Rakesh does. And uh, except mine will be in English and not in Hindi. Then when he came for dinner uh, to the house uh, in October, just after the, uh, this, then he's telling Lakshmi, he's saying, Chitti shuru ho gaya. Chitti shuru ho gaya. Why would he remember if it was something that was as trivial as it was? Why would he remember? Why would he care? You know, whenever he would come to Goa, especially during the pandemic, I think he came once just after the pandemic. He called me up and he says, Hum boss, tumko ek photo bhejega. So I said, kya photo? He's saying, I'm taking a foot massage in my, in my villa and you should see ki humko hum uh, rafi sahab ka aur uh, ye pyase ke gaane mein sun raha hu aur boss jeevan kushal mangal hai then i would ask him what are you doing about exercise what are you doing about fitness and his response was theek hai yaar hoga hoga ye wo rajneesh kumar the former chairman of state bank of india had his book launch in bombay in november at the oberoi uday kotak and he were in conversation now, Reggie is a very dear friend of mine and I'd help with the book. So I asked uh, Rakesh also to join us in the evening. Rakesh came for the book launch. All of us left. I introduced Rakesh to two people from New York, a mother and daughter. And the 
the mother's mother. So, you know, just at the book launch, I left because I was exhausted. Rakesh entertained them at the terrace of the chambers and said, Ki, Suhail, my brother, I will serve you for I will make sure you eat food and eat food from Who does it? Uh, sorry, this is the Taj Nadi Obra. You tell me who does this? Right. These were these were his little little these were the little nuggets about the man. You know, when he met the Prime Minister on October 10 in the morning, and that evening I was hosting a dinner for him at home. And it was a trudge for him. He was staying at the Taj Man Singh, which is in Latyan's Delhi, and he had to come all the way. It was a weekday. He had to come all the way to my house, which is in Gurgaon. And I really told him so. I said, listen, I don't want you to make the effort. It's too far. On a weekday, it'll take you about an hour and a half. And he was in a wheelchair. He had his attendant. And he says, no, I want to meet Lakshmi and I want to meet Gayatri, our daughter. And I mean, you know, you don't need to do these things. And that's my point three. Great human beings do things not because they should do them, but because they believe in them. A lot of people ask me, if I were to ever write, and one never imagined this would happen so soon, he's 62. A lot of people would say, how would you uh, uh, define Rakesh Junirwani? And if you were to write his epitaph, what would you say? And I would just say, a man so simple that he made life so easy for those with him and for those around him. And he was childlike. He was childlike even in his admiration. I remember one day him telling me, he says, I want to meet Ratan Tata. I said, fine. I called up Mr. Tata. I was with Mr. Tata and told him, I said, you know, by the way, uh, Rakesh Junavala wants to meet you. Now look at the beauty of Ratan Tata. I mean, this is how, you know, a person, Mr. Tata tells me, he says, no, no, I will go and call on him. I said, not at all. Mr. Tata's age and seniority and respect. I said, no, he will come. That meeting was to happen. It didn't happen because of COVID and, you know, all kinds of complications. Then, but because I put them in touch, Rakesh reached out to Mr. Tata. Then told me, he says, by the way, Amratan Sabko mil raya ye wo yo. I said, great. The meeting ended and he calls me. He says, I've never met someone like him. And then he went on public record. He went on record publicly to say, oh, the house of Tata is blessed. But this was his his interactions with anyone he met. Like I remember when he came to Gurgaon to my house, I live in a DLF complex, you know, Magnolias, blah, blah, blah. And he met the owner and he told the owner, he says, Are, I didn't know you built such a beautiful uh, complex. I would have invested even more. So <laughs> if you look at the man and you look at his analysis, he was always driven largely by emotion. But it was emotional intelligence. It was an emotional quotient that was a great driver, even in his business decisions. Because if he was hard and practical, who would have imagined, Sri, you tell me, in the early 80s or late 70s or early 80s, perhaps, when Titan was born, who would have imagined Titan as a company would have the kind of valuation it does? Who would have got into hotels? Now, who would have told me, you you tell me this, and this is a very interesting, who would have started an airline when everyone tells you, how do you become a millionaire from a billionaire? Started airline. <laughs> and 10 or 12 days ago, he took, he and Rekha went on the first Akasa flight uh, from uh, Mumbai to Ahmedabad. And I kept telling him, I said, are you sure? Ki bhai, uh, you, you know, you want to uh, uh, start an airline? He said, huh. He's saying, Bharat mein itna potential hai. He's saying, or from metro to tier one or metro to tier two is a great market. But then that is what I'm saying. It's so special about the man. His his love for Indian music. I remember he used to say, he says, Sanjeev Goenka ne bahut badiya kaam ki hai, karwa nikal ke. You know, it's those recorded uh, uh, old classic Hindi songs. Hmm. Now, you would have imagined a guy at his level would be, you know, leading the good life, which he did. But he led the good life with great simplicity, with great sagacity. 
he never forgot his roots. He never recog he always realized that his roots lay in who he was. And that's why he is so special and will always remain so. You know, um, I don't think anyone could have put in better words uh, a person of Rakesh's standing and intelligence than you, Sohail. And I'm reminded of one line from Muhammad Rafi's song, Pyar Mohabbat Ke Siva, Ye Zindagi Kya Zindagi. So, uh, because from all you are saying, this is how I can think of remembering Rakesh. And uh, I think he's leaving behind a big, big legacy. And I hope and I wish and pray that Akasha Air will be a success. By the way, I have to mention here, Prime Minister has started an initiative called Udan. And Udan gives a lot of incentives for uh, airlines to serve the underserved markets. And to smaller cities, tier two, tier three cities, if you fly there, you get great breaks. And I'm now seeing a lot of flights so that you can save on time. There are people who value time and you have only so much time in the life. The 24 hours hasn't changed. Everything else is going faster. Yeah. Time is still the same. Absolutely. And see, if you look at his, his portfolio of investments, the portfolio spread from watch companies to hotels, uh, now to an airline, uh, you know, uh, uh, healthcare, star insurance. So he's dabbled in a lot. And has he burned his fingers? I'm sure he has. But what was and what remains very inspiring is the man was riddled with optimism. It was as if failure was just a, a small, small hiccup in his life. <clears throat> and the other thing which is very important for you to know and for your viewers to know is that he was aware that there was sobriquets given like, you know, oh, big bull and this and that and homilies. And he was very conscious of the fact that when these, uh, you know, statements were made, there should not be a comparison to Harshad Mehta. So he was very careful that he had to and he must have and he did lead his life with great transparency and probity. Because the people would not normally assume that people in the markets are either fiddling or insider trading and all that. So he would, he made it even more clear to everyone that, look, I'm different. I'm going to follow the law. But the law allows you to operate and continue to make money without, you know, being a con man. Thank you very much, Suhail. And viewers, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. I'd like... So here to come more often to our channel. The fault is all mine. I don't invite him often enough. <laughs> and uh, you're a wealth of information and, and you're such a joyous story storyteller. It's, it's, it's wonderful to listen to you, Sohail. And I would uh, love thank to you so much. Gurus, you know that. I, I thank love you so every much. time I'm invited. I find it inspiring. I find it informative. And the kind of viewers you have, uh, it's, it's very interesting because the comments are invigorating and the comments are also challenging intellectually and which is what it should be. Thank you so much, sir. And viewers, please do send in your comments and uh, we, we love to listen from you and hear from you and we try to respond as many times as we possibly can. Thank you very much, Sahil. Namaskar. Thank you. Bye-bye.